and we want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon for our weekly update on unemployment insurance, uh, or at least change. For today, we wanted to follow pretty much the format that we've been using over the past couple of weeks, which is to show a couple of quick slides that give you an idea of what's specifically happening about um, unemployment insurance and the different uh, categories of claimants were, um, or stages that claimants are in in the process, and then also um, talk about some of the themes that have emerged over the last week as areas where there seem to be some concerns. So, for example, this week we're starting to get lots of questions about the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, which is slated to end July 25th. Um, we're continuing to have questions about the work search requirements, and we want to go into that again. Um, also, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, the redetermination of the weekly benefit level there. And then we have received um, just a couple of questions uh, specifically from legislators, and we want to answer those questions as well. Um, as always, please feel free to put any of your questions into the chat box just in case you didn't have a chance to get questions to us ahead of time. Um, and we will have time after we just walk through these, um, these slides and answer some of the, the, the broader questions to have, um, uh, you know, to answer any of the questions that you, that you have. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add or if we want to just jump right into the first slide. Yeah, let's jump into the first slide. <clears throat> so this is just a kind of a quick summary of um, the status of things. Uh, so far, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and we um, are using the date of March 15th as kind of the start date of um, pandemic activity here in Maine, um, roughly 96% of initial claimants have either re have received a determination. And those, um, what that means is that these folks fall into kind of three broad categories. They've received an initial benefit payment. So that's about 84% of people. So approximately 127,000 people have received benefits since March 15th. The next bucket are people who have been um, approved to receive benefits or completed their initial claim, but they have not filed weekly certifications. And that's about 8% of, um, of the folks that uh, are in that total, uh, that make up that total 100%. In terms of numbers, that's about 12,000 people who have to submit a weekly certification before benefits can be made. Now, we talked about this last week and the week before. Many of those people have um, been in that category for, for a number of weeks now. We send them a weekly email. Um, we are sending them a letter asking them to complete uh, their weekly certifications, and we have not heard back from them. A smaller group in this 12,000, roughly 2,700 of them, just applied last week for benefits. So this number is constantly, there's an, like an ebb and flow, although there are a core group of people who are not filling out the weekly certification. And there may be a perfectly good reason for it. They may have already gone back to work. They may have thought that they were going to be unemployed, and in fact, they weren't. Um, they, uh, you know, there could be a number of reasons for that, um, but uh, some of them are just because when you fill out your initial claim, that's kind of step one, but no benefits are released until you file the weekly certification. So that takes care of the 84%, the 8% who filed um, but haven't uh, filled a weekly claim, <coughs> and then there are about 3% of people who have been determined to be ineligible. Now, what um, this group of people are folks who on a weekly basis may have been determined to not be eligible for benefits. Um, these folks may have had excessive earnings. 
As you know, in regular unemployment insurance, there's a maximum weekly benefit. Before June 1st, that was $445 a week. After June 1st, it is now 462. So if you were filing initial claim after June 1st, the maximum weekly benefit would have been six, will is $462. So if you're, let's say you're working part-time, you may be, and you earn more than $5 more than those numbers, you would not be eligible for benefits that week. And that's important to remember because there are a number of folks who um, their weekly wages may be, let's say, $1,000 a week, and they may be working part-time and receiving $500. And so there's a gap between the $500 that they're earning and the $1,000 that they normally make. And, um, and they're uh, wondering why they're not getting unemployment benefits. And the reason is if your earnings exceed the maximum weekly benefit by $5 or more, you are not going to be eligible for benefits that week. So <clears throat> those are the first kind of three buckets of folks, but the people that we've been um, really focused on are the 4% of claimants that are not receiving benefits and who are um, eligible uh, to uh, either receive benefits or um, some sort of a determination. So Kim, I don't know if you wanna jump in here and talk about what we're doing to expedite uh, those sure. claims. Sure. And we'll get into this in a little more detail on a couple of slides, but uh, high level, we are dedicating a team of our adjudicators to going through and tackling the, the oldest cases that are still hanging out there. Uh, we've been making good progress on that this week, and we'll continue to, to work on those oldest claims um, through the weekend and into next week. And we are also um, always refining our fraud detection um, techniques. That's some of the reason why, as you'll see on these later slides, that some of the folks have not moved into payment is because it's the, of the potential of fraud. So we are always refining um, how we are flagging claims for that. Okay, let's go to slide two. And I think this slide starts uh, providing some of that information, Kim, about um, what's going on in terms of claims. So you'll recognize the graph from the past two weeks. You'll see that kind of, you know, we spiked at the beginning of, you know, going from that 634 all the way up to 30,910 um, claims that those initial three weeks, then we started to come down. Things seemed like they were stabilizing. And then in mid-May, we had another sharp spike um, of up to 16,000, oh, you know, 16,600 claims. And that was when we um, became uh, concerned because we had heard about fraud happening across the country and really started uh, analyzing some of the claims we were receiving at that time. Um, and when we, um, so that's when we formed the task force, we started working with um, you know, our federal and state law enforcement partners, as well as with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, because they have a data integrity hub that provides information about fraud to um, states across the country, and we're all working together on this. Again, the issue of fraud is not something that is uh, limited to Maine. Um, it is unfortunately something that's happening across the country. And then as you, you look at the graph and you see things starting to stabilize at about 3,000 claims per week. And then last week, we once again saw a spike in the number of claims that we're receiving um, to 4629 last week, which again raised, raises concerns for us. Um, we do know that in July, frequently, um, you know, our mills, <clears throat> um, take a you know temporary furlough during that time frame, um, but we also know that uh, fraud continues to be um, a problem everywhere, and so we are uh, doing a deeper dive and analysis of of those claims every week. We um, 
run claims through our fraud filters. And as Kim said earlier, uh, we're constantly adjusting and refining that because our goal is to get benefits out to eligible Mainers as quickly as possible. And at the same time, make sure that we are rigorously uh, evaluating claims so that we uh, minimize um, money that is being sent um, inappropriately out to, um, well, in this case, criminal, criminal uh, rings. So that's pretty much what the graph uh, is showing this week. Um, and I would just add, of those 4,600, it represented about 4,400 individuals. Um, we issued our press release yesterday um, that included the, the details of that information. Um, we also put out that we've uh, paid out over 1.1 billion as of uh, the end of last week, and um, you know, still averaging you know 70, 75 million a week, which is what we paid out in all of 2019. Yeah, and in, when you look at all of those claims numbers, um, it again, claims uh, don't equal people um, that we're talking about. Uh, these claims representing about 150,000 individual claimants. In total. Since March, yes. Okay, the next slide. So again, we wanted to do that kind of uh, deeper look into what's happening with uh, with the, um, the claims that are being paid. Again, roughly 84% have been paid out. Um, I'm trying to I can yeah, see so what that said. <laughs> about 3% who are currently ineligible. So these are the folks that we talked about on the earlier slide that had um, excess earnings for the weeks that they were filing. We have about 8% that um, have filed initial claim but haven't filed any weekly certifications. We have about 1% that are uh, flagged as potentially fraudulent, and that leaves the 3% that are in process. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in order to even bring down that 3%. As I mentioned, we're accelerating our fact findings, dedicating uh, staff to working on, from the oldest up through the newest to make sure that those fact findings are happening as quickly as possible, um, refining our, our fraud flag so that we are not holding um, those that we um, that are that are main main citizens and main filers. We skip to the, the next screen. Actually, um, this breaks down the the three percent uh, that are on hold. And as you can see, um, looking at that purple uh, section that's over on the, the right hand side, the pending status. This was about forty three percent of the folks that were on hold last week, and so we have made substantial progress this week to get those folks um, issues resolved and get them moved into pending status. And again, last week we talked a little bit about this. Uh, folks in the pending status may be there because there was, um, you know, the data from the employer and the, the employee didn't line up, you know, around wages. Uh, there could have been name mismatches, uh, could have been social security numbers that were inaccurate. Uh, those are the things that are in the pending kind of category. The awaiting fact finding, as uh, the deputy commissioner said, we are um, expediting the fact finding process. Uh, we are uh, have dedicated a small group of adjudicators to um, specifically focus on. Uh, going through fact finding as quickly as possible from the oldest to the newest. Um, their duties are limited um, just to the fact finding and we have made incredible progress there. Um, we also, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, had brought on law students for the summer and they are helping uh, as we speed up the process. Um, doing some of the work like calling constituents and gathering information so that the adjudicators can really stay focused on writing the decisions that need to be written and clearing out as many cases as possible. We had also mentioned last week that we will be bringing on some new adjudicators in two weeks. They start on July 27th mm -hmm. so that there will be, um, we knew we just had the law students for the summer, we need to 
strengthen our adjudicator team and expand it. And so there will be some, uh, some overlap as well. So we're working on all of those fronts to, uh, to uh, expedite the fact-finding process. One of the things that may be happening um, is that if you are scheduled for a fact-finding, you must have five days notice. One of the ways we're trying to speed this up is if our adjudicators have time prior to the time when the fact-finding was scheduled, they will reach out um, and contact the, um, the claimant. The claimant has the ability to decline to waive that five-day waiting period, so this in no way um, uh, requires someone to, uh, to talk to an adjudicator if they call prior to their scheduled time. Um, but um, most people that we're talking to are happy to waive that five-day um, notice period and instead um, take the fact-finding early. Um, but again, if, if someone feels they're not prepared, um, there is absolutely no requirement to participate in the fact-finding when the adjudicator calls. Um, although we are seeing most people happy to uh, participate. Um, we continue to, uh, tr to try to um, move groups of people at a time if we're able to identify certain issues. Um, the 12% up there uh, are uh, folks who have been denied for state unemployment insurance, which as you know, is step one. Um, the requirement of the CARES Act is that uh, in order to be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance, you must first be determined to not be eligible for state unemployment. Um, so this is a group of folks who have been denied uh, for state unemployment and uh, are waiting to be moved into um, pandemic unemployment assistance. We must have on record a um, uh, an application from that, uh, from anyone for, uh, in order to determine if they're eligible for PUA or not. So we are making sure that some folks who may not have filled out <coughs> the appropriate form, um, the, what's the right word? It's like the, the sheet <laughs> that lists the, the PUA um, eligibility requirements that we're getting that to folks um, again through the reemploy me system so it would pop up and they would be seeing this and they would have an opportunity once they've been denied for state ui to determine if they are in fact eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance and again um, even though pandemic unemployment assistance covers a wide range of people who were never before covered uh, for state unemployment insurance the reason for the eligibility must be, in order to be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance, you, you, your reason for your job separation, your job loss, your inability to be at work must be connected to COVID-19. And that's what the, the form kind of walks you through. So, uh, and just the remaining 10% are those um, that are new claimants and they're mm -hmm. in their initial evaluation period. Uh, we talk a lot about a B1, which is a separation form that we use to gather information from the employer. Um, and that's part of the normal 10 to 14 day processing time that it takes uh, to get a, a new claim into pay status. So I think that that is just kind of a top line overview of some of the numbers, some of the issues. Um, and in the um the before we jump into some of these questions uh i wanted to just do some top line overview of um of some of the programs and questions that we're getting that are kind of widespread questions and the first one is with the federal pandemic unemployment compensation program ending on july 25th 
as you know, that's that additional $600 that someone would be eligible for if they receive even $1 in pandemic unemployment assistance or state UI. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that this was the, the framework. It, it's going to require congressional action basically for anything to change with it. We're hearing a number of options. Um, one is that uh, the $600 Congress would act and that $600 would continue. Uh, one is that they will take some action uh, and that this uh, amount will be a lesser amount than $600, but some sort of flat rate. Another option that we've heard about is that there will be uh, different tiers of, um, of benefit based on the unemployment rate in particular states. And then uh, the final option that we've heard about is that uh, somehow the, um, the amount would be tailored to the individual earnings of the person who is, uh, has lost their job. <clears throat> um, we've been asked um, both by our uh, national um, association, the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, as well as some members of the congressional delegation, you know, how quickly we could implement a tailored um, wage uh, replacement like that. And it, it would be, um, let's just say a very long time. It would be incredibly challenging. We do not have, when we receive wage data from employers, it's aggregate data, it is not, uh, based on um, how many hours someone worked or the amount of money that they were making per hour. It's just a lump sum of their wages. So if, uh, and um, there's no um, labor department uh, in the country that thinks that it would be um, easy to do or that it could be done in a short period of time. So I, we don't know what Congress is going to do and whatever it is that they do, we will do our best to implement it. But that would be an incredibly challenging um, piece of legislation to implement. And I think people would wait a very long time anywhere in the country to have that, um, that done because, but, but we'll see. Um, but that's uh, what we know about what's happening <clears throat> with federal pandemic unemployment compensation. Um, we're also being asked about the work search. And um, yes, uh, if you did not see in the um, press release that we issued yesterday, we listened very carefully to what you said last week, recognized uh, the concerns uh, have gone back and are redrafting um, the, uh, um, the screenshots and are doing some, uh, some uh, testing of that. The date for uh, work search for people who are permanently separated from their job uh, will now be the week, uh, the week beginning August 9th. So there will be several weeks. As, uh, we will share information between now and then. We will have more information up on our website leading up to it to make sure that people have a clearer understanding of what their requirements are. <clears throat> Again, as you, as you know, in order to be eligible for unemployment, you have to have lost your job through no fault of your own. You must be able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work. Um, and uh, we'll get that uh, up to people as uh, on the website and also plan to do some um, additional training and outreach mm -hmm. efforts as well before that week of August 9th. So August 9th starts the work search requirement for those who are permanently uh, separated from their employer. That leaves the other group of individuals who are temporarily laid off. They're waiting for their business to reopen or um, have some other reason why they're not back at work yet. That is tied to the emergency legislation. 
and the declaration of Maine's civil emergency. And, and the emergency legislation says that the work search is waived for 30 days beyond the end of the uh, civil emergency. So if someone is still out of work and waiting to return to their uh, the employer that they were working for before the pandemic, they have um, at least until September 5th at this point. <laughs> and if someone is self-employed, they are considered to be job attached. Yes. So I just, we've gotten some questions about that as well. So um, and they, we, we encourage everybody to check out the main job bank. We do have about 10,000 jobs posted there. Um, it's a good time to start Create your account if you don't already have one to start looking at what is out there for available jobs. Um, and that is, you can find that, a link to that at maincareercenter.gov. And there are also the career centers, and I know last week some people um, mentioned uh, that uh, constituents were using the career centers, which is great. I think it's a wonderful resource for people, particularly around reemployment services. And the career centers are, um, have been providing virtual services all along, but are strengthening that um, the virtual services that they are offering, and that will continue. They will continue to add additional programs and additional um, variety of programs uh, as uh, uh, over the coming weeks. Um, one of the things that they will be doing is uh, virtual ca uh, career fairs. Um, they have been reaching out to employers as well uh, to list the jobs on the job bank. Uh, so there's an ongoing effort to, um, to both strengthen the services that are available and make sure that a, a variety of opportunities are available to people who are looking for work. Um, one of the things that we did not talk about was the pandemic unemployment assistance and the um, wage redetermination that will be happening. With that, I mentioned last week that uh, not everyone, and this is primarily people who are self-employed, will be required to upload documents. <clears throat> We're encouraging people to not, the um, website is not yet live, uh, but our goal is that by um, next week, there will be an opportunity to upload documents. However, we believe that only about 40% of the people will be uh, required to upload documents because we think we will be able to do um, automatic um, redeterminations of wages uh, with information that, that we will have um, by next week. But uh, as more information becomes available, we'll get that out to you. It's also important to remember that not everyone will see their basic weekly benefit amount in pandemic unemployment assistance increase, that there is a certain uh, wage threshold, which is a little over 13,000, it's about 13,600, that if your net earnings mm -hmm. are less than that amount in a year, you will stay at the um, weekly benefit amount of $172. So um, there will be some folks that uh, will be, um, their earnings are less than that, their income is less than that. So they will not need to be providing additional information. Um, and then for those who have, uh, you know, tax documents that are available, um, we will do redeterminations. It will be clear on your, um, your account uh, what that redetermination is. There will also be an opportunity to appeal <coughs> that uh, amount if that, uh, you believe that it is inaccurate. Um, but again, that will be getting um, more information will be coming next week about that. Um, I think we've got some questions. So the first one up there is, do you have an estimate on when that dedicated group will get through fact findings for the 65%? So fact findings are, are a rolling number. So there's not a, uh, every week that you take in claims, issues are identified that may result in fact finding. 
So um, I think what would be more helpful, and we can provide this next week, is a look at um, aging, uh, which will tell the story um, or answer your question a little bit better. Um, because there would be fact findings that are just getting scheduled because of issues that are coming up in July. Um, and there are fact findings that were scheduled from May. And we'll do a breakdown for you um, uh, next week on that, because I think that's really what you're trying to understand. But if it's not, just let me know. Uh, I mentioned last week that more info would be provided about our constituents whom we have elevated. When is that beginning? I, that's in response to um, the, the individuals that we've received from the, the legislat legislators that we have in the spreadsheet. Um, we should be getting those on a daily right. basis. If you're not, please. Well, we, we reply on a daily basis for those that we have worked. Yeah. yeah, and I think what it is is that we could, um, we could provide more information about the buckets that people are in. <clears throat> so whether they're in fact finding or they're in uh, a pending status, uh, and I'm trying to see, is that Senator, Senator Millett, is, is that the question that you're asking and would that be helpful? I, I just, I have folks that have been on the um, elevated list for over a month and I have no idea where they are in the process. I don't okay. know if their cases are even being looked at or yeah, even having an idea of what bucket they're in. Yep. I, I'm completely in the dark and on probably six or more of my constituents. Okay. Well, they should be on the elevated list. And I think what the request is, is can you take that list and, um, and group it according to where people are at? And the answer is yes. And we will get those to you. Uh, I'm trying to see, why would an employer get a notice that its experience rating is being charged? They shouldn't. That's the standard language that was in place before the emergency legislation. Um, we will double have to double check on. There I is thought that had been removed. Yeah, so did I. There's, they should not be uh, receiving notification. Um, I think the, the caveat is if the, um, if, the, if the separation was due to COVID, um, so that's what the emergency legislation is, is if it's COVID related, um, but we can, if you get us the name of the employer, that would be helpful for us to look at as well. Uh, questions about why the bank delays continue to happen? I think, unfortunately, there are a variety of reasons why the bank delays happen. It's not as though there's one thing. Um, Any time that you're dealing with um, large volumes and multi-parties, there's a possibility that, um, that something could go wrong. It's not as though there was you know, one thing that happened. I think there were, uh, once it was a holiday weekend, once it was um, that the department, we have to upload um, files. We've encouraged people <clears throat> to spread out their weekly certifications over the week. Understandably, people do not want to do that. They want to um, file their weekly certification as early as possible, which is usually on Sunday. Um, so there are extremely large batches of files that go on uh, Sunday and Monday. Um, what we have done is we have broken on our side, broken it into um, different batches so that we're not doing one single upload at the same time. And, uh, and then the bank had an issue on their end. So um, on things that we can control and can predict, we have adjusted the process, um, but there are always um, unexpected things that, that do happen. But I think 
if you look at the um, the process, even since the pandemic began, uh, it is um, it happens occasionally. It is not a um, a weekly occurrence, although it has happened uh, too often. Okay, is there, uh, constituents receive communication that someone will be calling them and then no one calls. Is there a way to let constituent, let DOL know that they never received a call? So I'm assuming this is related to the fact findings. Um, you know, in some of, so the, the expediting process, we are letting folks know that, well, this will replace your fact finding that's, that would have happened, you know, later in July or in August, even. Um, putting that information also in the determination that's being sent out so that we are communicating better that the fact finding in the future will not happen. Um, we do know that there's been some incidents that um, an individual was notified that there was a scheduled fact finding, um, but it, it didn't update on our end. So that is why um, those folks did not receive a call for that fact finding. And they, those individuals who we missed the fact finding on were prioritized already. I think there was also back in April uh, when we were, um, we were expediting some of the uh, claims things that normally we would have scheduled a fact finding for, we were moving forward without the fact finding. And so they were um, canceled on our end and the constituents didn't, didn't know that. And that was our fault and that process has been changed. Okay. So the folks who have not filed weekly certifications, is it clear they have access um, on their end and that the computer, or is it just that the computer is not letting them file? Um, from what we're able to see, it's that they, for whatever reason, are not filing. Um, I mean, there may be some cases where they have been locked out, <clears throat> but that's not primarily um, what we're seeing, but if you, you know, we do have the, um, we've encouraged anyone who's locked out of their account, needs password reset to use the career centers, um, anyone like that, um, we are um, immediately um, working with. Uh, that process seems to be working for most folks. Uh, and the question is, how are we getting in touch with these people? Um, through, we've been sending weekly emails to people and we are also adding a, um, uh, a regular uh, U.S. Postal Service mailing to the folks as well. So we do have a couple of questions that came in ahead of time. Uh, we had one question about self-employed worker uh, is paid for a job in one lump sum, should that income be divided by the number of weeks the work consumes? Uh, in this case, uh, the example is an Airbnb host. Um, so the answer is yes, the, the income should be divided over the weeks that are applicable. So if it's an Airbnb and the rental covered a two week period, the income from that week should be divided over the two weeks. Because similar to when you report um, you know, W-2 earnings on your weekly certification, any self-employment earnings have to be reported in the week that the income is earned, even if it's not paid until the end of the two-week period when, they, when the, um, the Airbnb person actually pays for their, their room. So, and, I, and I guess, I, again, I would also add um, that that would be net income. So it would be the income for the, for the period minus any expenses that are associated with that. So there's a question about, could we add a robocall to the people who haven't <clears throat> responded to weekly certifications or other media? Um, uh, the other media part, I think we've done things on Facebook, we've done things, you know, press releases. Um, I don't uh, know that we have the capacity for a robocall, but it's a good idea okay, and we yeah. can check into it. <laughs> 
And then what's the update on extended benefits? So uh, two weeks ago, the federal emergency, no, the pandemic emergency, pandemic emergency unemployment. unemployment compensation program uh, was rolled out. So that's the federal 13 week, week extension. So that is um, up and available now. Uh, the state um, extended benefit program is in uh, testing uh, at the moment, and that should be uh, available very soon. And we do recognize that there are individuals who are coming to the end of their, the 13 weeks that mm -hmm. were available through that pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, and, and we will be moving them to extended benefits. So, and I, I, I can't I have a constituent it. who has been out of work since March 25th, has filed weekly certifications and still has not received anything from unemployment. He heard from someone at DOL in June saying his claims were being worked on then, hasn't heard anything since. Um, has received a notification, his claims have expired and the system will not let him reapply. Uh, and I think this is probably, I can't see the name of the, the uh, legislator, um, but I think that this is probably uh, one that we are actively working on, but if you want to connect offline to just verify this, but um, Yeah, and uh, another question about it's important for people to know where they're at in the process and that people are in limbo and not getting answers. Um, and they are understandably panicked and we hear that, we know that, and um, we can tell you where folks are uh, in the process. Unfortunately, things are not um, always as easy to resolve as, um, as any of us would like. For example, some of the folks who are in the um, disqualified for unemployment, but waiting to roll into PUA category, um, folks in, not everyone, but um, some typical examples of people who are in that category are people who uh, quit their job in, uh, prior to the pandemic, and as you know, uh, in regular state UI, um, unless there's a good cause, a voluntary quit is something that um, you would typically not be eligible for unemployment under. Um, another group of people are people who um, may have been discharged. Um, uh, again, not people who would typically be covered by state unemployment insurance. Um, but if they are either of those groups of people are unable for whatever reason to um, work because of a COVID-19 related reason, <coughs> and they meet um, the requirement of being connected to, you know, having some sort of job connection, they might be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. The way that the um, unemployment insurance program is set up, it has certain um, triggers in place to, that automatically hold cases like that. Voluntary quits, discharge, um, what uh, people who went back to work and uh, received payments and were in an overpayment status and needed to pay uh, the program back before they could be eligible again. Um, many of the folks who are not, um, you know, I know everybody's heard that, well, they're supposed to be rolling into PUA. In order for that to happen, um, all of those other um, integrity measures in the system need to be suppressed in order to allow that to happen. Um, so it is not uh, a quick process. It is, um, it's a painful process for the people who are waiting. We are working as um, fast as we can 
to make sure that anyone who is eligible for benefits under pandemic unemployment assistance um, does receive them. And so we received one other question um, prior to the briefing about constituents who are not able to answer the, the gender question um, they're, because they're getting an error in the system. I am aware that there is an issue with answering that question in the, in the account profile, um, but it should not prevent anybody from filing their initial claim. So within the Reemploy Me system, you can create your account and you can go in and um, answer some basic questions. You can set up your direct deposit. Um, I am aware that in that account profile, the gender question um, has a problem with it. However, you can also answer all of that you can provide all of that information, you can answer the gender question, you can set up your direct deposit through filing the initial claim. And my understanding is that works um, as it should. So I would suggest that the, the folks try to file their initial claim and if, if they are unable to go into that separate section with a re-employee and file an initial claim, um, please do let us know and if you could provide names that would be helpful. Yeah, and the other thing too is is if they have not gotten beyond that, then there's probably no claim on file for that person. And I would be very concerned about that because they may be waiting for something to happen. Um, and, um, and without actually filing, uh, you know, creating an account and filing uh, an initial claim and a weekly certification, they will not receive benefits. Um, one of the things that uh, we have done um, is provide basic training on how to um, file an initial claim to our career center staff. And uh, usually it is, um, people are usually able to get through to the career center staff to help them with those basic um, unemployment insurance issues like creating an initial account. Um, and the career centers, in addition to having an uh, a toll-free number. They also have a live chat option, and I think, Kim, you gave the um, email address earlier. It's the website is maincareercenter.gov, and Maine Career Center is all one word. And if people go to that, if what they're really trying to do is file that initial claim, um, someone should be able to help them fairly quickly through that avenue. And I hear again about people being in limbo and uh, just if they know that something's in the works, it would help. Um, yeah, we are uh, trying to uh, get information back to do that turnaround to you as quickly as we can, even if um, it is just giving you that status update. Are there other questions? If not, um, I would just uh, encourage people again to, um, we, we're hearing from some folks that they just go to the Reemploy Me website, um, and that is great if what you're trying to do is file a claim, but for any of the updated information, if you go to the um, main.gov website slash unemployment. That's the place that we provide um, the FAQs and more in-depth information. And we will definitely um, be uh, updating the FAQs um, and providing any updates that we get on the um, what's happening with the uh, federal pandemic unemployment compensation program. Um, yeah, the question is, could we put the FAQs on the Reemploy Me site as well? We have limited ability to put anything um, directly on that site. So um, if people go to the uh, Reemploy Me website, I... Um, yeah, the, the main.gov slash unemployment, um, we, I would love it if that's the starting point for anybody who wants to file their claim, because then they're going to see all of the messages and there's a link right there to log into Reemploy Me. That's also where we have the, um, the 
any of the documents that walk you through the videos all of that information is on the the main.gov website so that looks like uh that's about it. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your, your attention. We really appreciate you flagging issues for us so that um, you know, you're the ones who are out there talking to people every single day in your community. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, we also talk to people every day, um, but it's uh, good to have your perspective. Um, we appreciate all of the work that you're doing and um, uh, value it. So, so thank you very much. Thank you.